So stepping back, what we were talking about on the tax section was we were talking about two different approaches to how you can think about sort of solving the challenge of the of kind of like okay, of the information challenges in the developing in developing world and the tax structure, right? One of them was through thinking about how do you design a tax code that sort of allows you to get information revelation. And the other is sort of how do you actually sort of maybe through the tax administration system just sort of get better data on people. Okay, and those were the sort of the two approaches. So we talked last time like in the examples about the VAT about how do you think about that through changing tax administration. The other thing I want to talk about now is how do you think about that, how do you think about like whether the tax administration margin is kind of interesting or, or is relevant and what are some of the challenges in doing that. Okay, so I want to talk about two papers that, that, uh, on this, and then I'll more or less wrap this up and sort of switch to the next topic. Okay, so this is a paper, actually, this is also a, pa a paper that, these are, these are both papers that I've worked on, so, um, you know, for, for better or for worse. So this actually is a, a recent paper, it's actually now forthcoming, um, on tax administration versus tax rates, to understand sort of, is, just at some very broad level, like, is tax administration um, sort of a, a, um, a, a really big deal or not? And, um, and so and we want to do that in a way in which we can benchmark it or compare it to like a traditional tax rate change. Okay, so the typical thing you do if you're like, you know, reading about sort of what debates about uh, taxes, the typical thing we think about doing is, you know, raise the rate, lower the rate, change the base, those kinds of things. Can we compare just a straightforward change in improvement in tax administration to one of these more traditional things like changing the tax rates? Okay, and so we're going to do this in in Indonesia studying two reforms. These were corporate taxpayers. One was a corporate a taxpayer administration reform. And here the idea is that corporate taxes tend to be very skewed. So people on the sort of the, basically like, you know, the firm distribution is skewed. So there's a small number of really large firms that pay most of the tax. And therefore you may want to sort of invest your sort of tax administration kind of on those firms. Uh, lots of countries do this for the very biggest taxpayers. In Indonesia, when we were studying this, was kind of rolling out this same idea to kind of medium-sized taxpayers. Okay, so they, they, in particular, they, they rolled out these medium-sized tax offices uh, to serve kind of the largest 330 taxpayers in each region, and we're going to study kind of the, the impact on firms when those were created. Uh, and we're going to find really big impacts, okay? Um, the second thing is just a tax rate reform, um, and basically, um, here, the identification is going to come from the fact that they, I don't think I brought the graph, actually. Um, but they used to sort of, I mean, you know, actually, let me not focus on this one. I want to focus on the tax administration reform. But you can read the paper if you're interested. They, they, they had a, a switch from sort of um, uh, a, a tax rate that was based on your taxable income to a tax rate that was based on your gross income. And so that gives you identification for, for, for the change in tax rates. Fine. Um, So I want to focus on the tax administration reform. So the typical um, diffs and diffs assumption that you guys have seen in kind of multiple papers throughout the semester, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure Ed talked about it in sort of the diffs and diffs lecture. Oh, but Ed, did you, how much did you go into like matching, propensity score matching stuff? Not at all. Great. So I'm going to talk about that right now. Okay. Um, is the control groups, the control group is on the same trends as the treatment group of the treatment, right? That's the assumption. Okay. So that's, in this context, we're going to study firms that, so, so what's the identification? The identification is in each of these, or the thing we're studying is in each of these regions, they create a special office for large firms, okay? So, um, and they move the kind of biggest firms into this special tax office, and we want to study the impact of that, okay? The problem is that the firms that are moving in are large firms, right? They literally take the largest firms in each, in each area and move them in. So if you, if you saw this and you said like, you know, um, what would be the, you know, the, they're going to treat the largest firms in each area, like what would you think of in terms of identification strategy? If, if you like were like rummaging around like the Indonesian tax office and came about this thing where they're creating a tax office for the largest firms in each region, like what would you be thinking about for identification? Yeah. Well, what we could do is if they had a particular cutoff for the size of the office, we would try to do that. Exactly, right. You would think you would do an RD, and that's what we thought too. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, so we thought we would do an RD. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't do that because um, basically the, uh, the RD was done in some combination of 
you know, different other variables, gross income, which is your revenue, tax payments, maybe some other variables in some formula. They had some Excel sheet in each of the 19 different regions and the Excel sheets were lost to the recycle bin of time. Um, so unfortunately, and, and I'd say despite our many, many efforts, right, every, we, we got graphs where we could try to replicate the formula. You know, we got graphs that look like this. Probability that you were assigned to the new thing, right, looks like this. This is like firm size. And it was like beautifully continuous and there were no discontinuities. And I think that that's because you know, so clearly they were, like we had the right variables. They were definitely doing it based on this assumption, but because we couldn't reproduce the exact thing that was used, we couldn't do an RD. And I have to say, I, this is not the first time this has happened to me. Um, that, uh, so we tried, but, but ultimately it kind of looked like that. So what we did instead is we used, yeah. Even if you cannot produce exactly, wouldn't a fuzzy RD? But if the graph looks like this, there's no discontinuity. Like, it's all continuous. <sighs> like, I think that basically what happened is because we didn't know the formula well, because I think that the, the issue is we didn't know the underlying running variable, nor do we know. I, th I think what happened is a couple things. Number one, we couldn't reproduce the exact underlying running variable. For example, maybe they used an older version of the tax data that wasn't exactly right. Maybe they had other things going on. Like, we, we couldn't find RD, basically. Huh? What about provence dimension? That's what we're gonna do. Oh. Yeah, that's the answer. Yes, that's where we're going. So uh, instead, we're gonna use propensity matching, match differences and differences. And so I just wanted to, this is what I wanted to talk about. So instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, look, it's pretty obvious with this kind of design that you know, if I if I look at sort of say these for like you know over here, like everyone is treated, over here nobody is treated. So it's kind of hopeless there to find kind of reasonable comparison sets. But in this group, kind of in the middle. Right, you know, your probability of being treated is sort of somewhere in between, you know, is, is in some intermediate range, and therefore, you know, we may be able to sort of compare similar firms that just some of them happen to get treated and some of them didn't happen, happen not to get treated. Okay, and that's kind of the idea of propensity score matching, right? So, so what do you do? You basic, so, the, so how do you do um, uh, propensity score matching? Okay, so or in general for matching, there's sort of a couple of steps. The first step is exactly this. You have to restrict, you, you take your sample and you, um, you want to restrict to the area of which, where there's called common support, right? Where basically there's going to be, you know, reasonable fractions of people who are both treated and not treated, or in this case, firms that are treated and not treated. Um, so you have, you know, reasonable matching there, okay? So, Otherwise, you end up, like, there's nobody in the control group who's going to be a good comparison here, and no one in the treatment group who's going to be a comparison to this firm here. So you just cut that sample out. And you should recognize that sort of the late you're estimating, right, local average treatment effect you're estimating is for that kind of medium set. Okay, so in our case, for example, we're going to be estimating an effect for like the smaller firms that go into the medium tax office because the larger firms that go into the medium tax office, like they're just, you know, getting treated with close to probability one. So in our case, actually, it's a little more complicated because we're, we're actually doing this on two different variables. We have, because we know that they matched on, gro on your revenue, which is your gross income, and your taxes paid. So we're going to do it on both. But it looks kind of like this. So this is the distribution of, um, this is the distribution of gross income in the baseline year. This is the, last, the year they used for assignment. And you can see that like, the treated groups have much, are much bigger than the control groups. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to say I think you know do say 97th and 2.5th percentile. What does that mean? We'll say well when I get down over here when there's only 2.5 percent of the distribution here, we'll make a cutoff there in the treatment group, and then we'll go the other way around and we'll get a, do the same cutoff here in the uh, control in the 97th and a half in the in the control group, and so that gets us this intermediate set. Where we sort of have like reasonably, um, like a reasonable number of, of firms uh, from both distributions. Now, one thing you'll notice if you look at this graph, of course, kind of intuitively, is that you know over down on this part of the distribution, right, you have way more controls than treatment, and over on the this part of the distribution, you have way more treatments than controls. 
Okay, so the next step after you sort of made this common support restriction is you need to sort of deal with that fact and make these two groups kind of look similar uh, by waiting. By waiting. Okay, so as I mentioned, we actually do this in two dimensions. We do it in this dimension. This is on uh, taxes paid. It looks kind of you know similar idea, right? The the firms assigned to the treatment group are paying a lot more taxes. Okay, so you do these restrictions. Um, the next step is you use the pre-period data to reweight the treatment and control group so that the weighted distributions look the same. Okay, so instead of having this, because if I if I just took this regression kind of this on this sample without doing any weights, it still would be um, mostly bigger firms in the treatment and mostly smaller firms in the control. But you can easily sort of see from this picture how I could just reweight them to make them look kind of the same. Okay, and that's what that's what that's really all propensity score matching is going to do. Okay, so so how do you do that? Okay, so the, how do you actually compute the weight? So there's a couple of different options. So one is what's called a propensity score. So if you know the functional form of the assignment rule, okay, you can just estimate it, and you can use it to calculate the weights. Okay, so if, for example, you know, uh, say say it was sort of like you know a probit, you know, like probability that you're in the treatment group is some x prime beta, where some you know the x's, right, and you know this functional form, you can run this auxiliary regression, predict the probability you're in there as a function of these multiple different variables, and then um, you can use weights one over p for the treatment unit and one over one minus p for the control group you, you control units using the predicted values, and that'll just make the weights balanced. Okay. So that's option one. The other option, and this is kind of a newer approach, is a more non-parametric approach, which just sort of solves for the weights directly. Okay. And, and basically, and this is look if I don't know the functional form. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, um, I'm going to look for a set of weights in the control group so that I balance, so that I just match whatever moments I want to match uh, in, the, um, in the treatment group um, on, you know, on a variety of different characteristics. Okay? And so this, there are a couple of different versions of this. This method by Heinmiller is the one that we use in the paper. The idea of it basically is to say, look, let me just solve for a set of weights that matches on whatever things I want it to match on that um, are going to minimally deviate from uniform weights. Okay, so there are, of course, many different combinations. If you have, if you have more observations than moments you want to match on, there are many different ways of doing it. It chooses the one that is like least, uh, has the least deviation from uniform weights. Okay? So, um, and there's some arguments actually that in cases where you don't actually know the propensity score or the propensity score formula isn't exact, these non-parametric methods can actually do a better job kind of matching things. And, uh, and that was our experience actually in doing this, which is why we went for these. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. You can, all the results in the paper go through if we do the regular propensity score, but I just wanted to mention this as well because it's sort of a newer, and there's a nice, um, it's a newer method and there's a nice sort of canned uh, data package that will do this for you. So in any case, first step, co common support. Second step, estimated propensity score and rebalance. Um, third thing is then you can just estimate your difference in difference model on the reweighted data. Okay, and that's, and that's what we're, uh, we're, uh, we're going to do. You might have said, well, why do I even care? Why even bother? Like one question you may have is why even bother like this? Why, why even do a different, why even bother with this reweighting? Why not just do a regular difference in difference? And I think the reason is that you might think that like these different, there's two, you might, these different groups might be on kind of different trends or whatever. And so you really want to sort of have comparable to comparable to make sure you're sort of balancing the trend properly. Any questions? Okay, that's mostly what I wanted to say about propensity scores, but I sort of want to make, throw it, throw it in there. Yeah. Small question about like, how does the balancing and weighting methods compare to, for example, a exact not with replacement that match each treatment unit with one, two, two three, like very similar control unit. Oh, um, oh, so like exact matching? So I don't have, it's a good question. I don't have a, str I, um, let me think for a minute and see if I have a good answer for you. So, so another, so you're saying another option is for every option in the treatment group, I find the closest match in the, tre in the control group and I just sort of put them together and put in a match fixed effect. Um, that's a good question, actually. I don't have a good answer for why, whether that would be. 
Well, if you have more Good question. I'm not sure I have the right answer. I think if you have more treatment, if you have more of one, if you have if you have unbalanced numbers of observations, and you end up either having to reuse the same ones multiple times, it may be inefficient compared to this. That's my best guess, but I don't know the answer actually. Does anyone else have any ideas? I don't know the answer. I do. It's a good, it's a good question. It's not, it's not really answer. Okay. So this just shows you the raw data. This is like total taxes paid. This is kind of the, this is a year when the thing is partially, the, the thing takes two years to kind of fully turn on. It's partially turned on in 2006, fully turned on in 2007. Um, and um, what you can see is you can see that there, this is just the raw data weighted. So you can see that sort of the, the pre-trends look kind of nice and balanced between the, once you, once you, in these two weighted samples, and then clearly something pretty dramatic is happening when we turn on the, 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 the median tax office. They seem to be paying a lot more taxes. Okay, and this just shows it to you in normal, like dip and dip kind of uh, estimation form. Um, so in fact, actually, their taxes go up by a lot. They go up by like more than 100%. Um, and you know, the, the government raises a lot of revenue. And you know, comparing this to sort of tax, uh, tax rate changes, um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, you know, uh, it, it's sort of staggeringly large and equivalent to kind of raising taxes on, raising the tax rate by, uh, I think, 6 or 8% on all taxpayers. Okay, so uh, the substantive point is that tax administration can make a really big difference. Um, and the thing I want to talk about methodologically is sort of how do you think about doing these match differences in this case. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to skip this. Oh, actually, no, this I wanted to say too. Okay, sorry. So, you know, why might this make such a difference? So, what, so one thing that's kind of striking and surprising, I think, is that it continues to actually go up over time. So you might have thought that once tax, once you put in kind of a new tax enforcement regime, there'll be like a direct effect where you'll sort of get more tax, collect more taxes, and then firms will start to figure out how to adapt. So you might have like predicted it would go kind of like, you know, like up and then down, right? Over time as firms start to adapt. That doesn't seem to be the case. In other measures, it seems to always look to be going up. So one answer is just it takes some time to learn stuff, and the tax and these tax inspectors are figuring stuff out. That could be. But one thing that we think is kind of interesting is that there may be also a change in, in size, a reduction in size-dependent taxation. So what do I mean by this? So imagine you have a simple model. This is actually not the model in the final version of the paper. This is like a simpler model that was in a previous version of the paper, but I think it just makes the point very clearly. So imagine you're a firm, right? Uh, that you, you know, you uh, um, who who can both make decisions about how much to pay, and they can maybe evade some taxes. E. Uh, they're taxed on. A, um, um, this is this is a model where there's distortions. So they're supposed to pay taxes here. They pay taxes on on this, um, but they can kind of evade some revenue here. So the, the firm's um, uh, production will be uh, distorted by the taxes because the tax is not, if the tax is a profit tax, it doesn't, it doesn't distort your revenue, but, if it's, but since there's this wedge here, um, it, it, may, uh, it, may be, uh, it may be some distortions. Um, what I wanted to say is suppose that in addition to that, the cost of evasion now, the, the, uh, you have some cost of tax evasion. We, where alpha is kind of the level of tax enforcement. Suppose you have the case where the level of tax enforcement is dependent on firm size. Okay, so it's pretty intuitive that kind of in a, if a, as I mentioned before, they're going after kind of the largest firm because they're sort of biggest. If that's true, then that's going to create an additional, um, there'll be the, a just general distortion in taxation but there'll be this additional distortion from taxation coming from the fact that as you grow larger, you're more likely to sort of get taxed by the tax authority. So if that's true, you know, once, you, so, so then the question is, once you've been put into this medium-sized tax or, uh, organization, does that change not just the level of enforcement, but also does it change this slope of enforcement with respect to firm size? And if so, like that could potentially explain like, like part of what's going on. 
And so we actually in this also sort of looked at the relationship between the probability of enforcement as a function of firm size. We looked at the a function of firm size and how that changed when you move to the MTO. So for the, the regular people in the small tax office, the probability of being audited, for example, is very strongly increasing in firm size. Once you're moved to the, to the medium tax office, it's flat. Basically, they have enough resources to audit everybody, essentially. Or to audit, not everybody, but with, high probability, with higher, much higher probability. Um, and this is true in sort of a couple of different dimensions that we can measure. And the reason I wanted to mention that is I think there's this issue where um, I think there's a, there could potentially be an issue where in a lot of these developing country contexts, you know, if the tax department is only starting to sort of pay attention to people who are kind of larger, that that in itself can create distortions. And so I just wanted to mention that. So in this case, we actually think the opposite happened. Kind of once they got sufficiently, once they were put in the MTO, at that point, that that already ha that was kind of sunk. They they were already getting you know the high tax treatment kind of regardless. So at that point, they may as well sort of they lose that inc the, 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 that incentive not to grow too big kind of disappears. But more generally, that poised point about sort of size dependent taxation creating kind of distortions for firm size is one I just wanted to mention. Okay, that's all I wanted. Yeah, Aaron. Um, I'm forgetting the paper, but was there, um, when these MTOs were created, was there displacement of people who were previously working in the smaller taxpayer offices? And, and it was a, were there effects on revenue from that displacement? I think it was small, because the number the, the number of staff they needed for the MTOs was, was pretty small, and so I think that they didn't really have to, like, and they could also promote other people and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay, so if tax administration kind of matters, then there's now a whole series of questions for sort of like how do we actually do it? And what are the particular kind of like, um, and, are, and that's true kind of everywhere, but I guess a question for a development class is like are there particular like development related issues in, in doing that, in, in changing tax administration? So I wanted to, to mention one last paper, which is a paper of mine on, uh, on this issue. So. One thing people have thought about doing to improve tax administration is to just give incentives to, ta to tax officers, right? You know, the whole idea is we need these people to sort of go out and collect taxes, like um, in this low information environment, we rely on the people, right? Um, maybe we need to sort of give them incentives to do this, okay? So in fact, giving high-powered incentives to tax collectors is a very, very old idea, right? Uh, in fact, it goes back to the, like the, the Roman Empire uh, or in, or in the, the French, uh, you know, pre-revolution France, they had people who were called tax farmers who basically paid a fixed fee to the king and they got to keep all the taxes on the margin. Okay, so it was like 100% um, incentive. Um, this was very unpopular. Um, so for example, the tax farmers were beheaded during the French Revolution. So that was not, um, you know, people didn't like this very much. And why didn't they like it? Well, because these people were super zealous in terms of, in terms of collecting taxes because they got to keep it all on the margin, right? So, you don't want to go too far. And in fact, if you were to, um, in fact, if you look at the, that um, you, know, you all live in Massachusetts, if you, if you look at the Massachusetts Department of Revenue's ta uh, website, there's a taxpayer bill of rights. And one of the things that Massachusetts states is that they will not, under any circumstances, create any incentives or even tar informal targets for, uh, for revenue for any of their tax staff. In part because taxpayers don't like this. So, um, so I think so. We wanted to understand, kind of, in a more modern context. On the other hand, though, if you go to a, a lot of these developing country contexts where the information problems are really severe, and you have to motivate these people to go collect taxes, like maybe the state should think about kind of like revisiting this trade-off. So, how do we think about this? Okay, so we did this by look, doing a randomized experiment in Pakistan, where we were um, working with property taxes. And property taxes are collected by a team of tax collectors. Okay, there's a team of three tax staff who, and together if they were put in the treatment group, they receive between 20 to 40% of all the revenue collected above some historical benchmark. Okay? Um, so you can think of like each of them as sort of, you know, getting a 10% kind of uh, payment on the margin. Okay, so any thoughts on like what would likely to, be hap to happen if you did this treatment? So you see why they would do it, right? You, they would do it because, like, so, so what, let me back up. Why, why do they need this incentive in Pakistan and not in Brookline, for example, where I live, right? So in Brookline, 
they have you know very good information about all of the of all, all the houses, right? And um, what, you know they everyone's required to build a, to have a building permit. You know the building permit is automatically linked to the tax people. If you change your house, the building people know that the town knows about it through the building permits. They can you know send the tax people out. They sort of you know and, and it's all kind of linked together. So they do rely on tax inspectors, but they have much more sort of data data underlying them. And also the the penalty you know the, the if the tax inspector were to come to my house and offer to you know adjust my taxes in return for a, a cash payment, the probability that that would end up in detection and that you know they would end up going to, going to jail is probably reasonably high, and so that probably doesn't happen very often. Okay, so that's, but in Pakistan that might not be true, right? So, so um, you know, what do you think is going to happen in this? So, so that's why they might want to do incentives. So what do you think is going to happen with incentives? Yeah, Jenny. Um, they exert more effort, so there's more total tax revenue. Okay, right. So. Incentives matter. They should they should exert more effort and collect more tax revenue. Paolo, um, if there is like a collusive evasion between the the tax staff and like the person being taxed, um, you like might not observe any change in revenue, and you just have like a change in like how they bargain for. Like exactly, you've seen this paper before in a previous yes, <laughs> but yes, exactly right. So the other pot, the uh, the other the other thing is, um, so Jenny's totally right. They could collect more tax revenue. On the other hand, if they're sort of like bargaining with, if they're potentially corrupt and kind of bargaining with the taxpayer, this could just, all this could do is kind of change the underlying bargaining game. Okay, and so that's what we want to sort of illustrate in, in this paper, is how do we think about kind of those two different things. So um, we set up in the paper a very simple kind of Nash bargaining model with equal bargaining weight, okay, between a taxpayer P and a tax collector C. Uh, to collude and reduce their tax liabilities. So what does this mean? This means I'm the taxpayer. Like I go to say Ashana, and I say like you know, I'm the tax collector. I go to you, and you say, look, you know, your house is worth a thousand. Your tax is a thousand dollars, but you know maybe you and I can work something out, and uh, in exchange for a payment, maybe I can reduce your your official tax liability, right? So how does that kind of bargaining work? So imagine that tau star is the true amount of tax, which is the same for everyone. We can instead negotiate to pay a bribe B and report less tax tau, okay, to the government. So to, together, together we can do that. The taxpayer's utility is going to be minus tau, right? Um, they don't like paying taxes. Minus B, they don't like paying bribes. Taxes and bribes are going to enter the same here. Those are just money kind of flowing out the door. And we're going to give them an additional cost, like alpha times tau star minus tau, which is sort of the like a disutility cost from uh, from paying bribes, or from, from underpaying their taxes. Sorry. Okay, and maybe there's the different that alpha is sort of heterogeneous among taxpayers. The tax collector's utility is going to look like this. It's going to have um, they're going to get an incentive payment r times the taxes they pay r tau. They're also maybe get some bribes. They like money, and they let money is treated equally here. They like incentives. They like bribes, but they also get a disutility cost from underpay, underreporting their true taxes. Okay, and you can think of that as like um, uh, um, you know some chance they get caught or or something. Maybe they just want to be honest or whatever. Okay, and this simple model, everything is linear. There's a version of the paper in the appendix that's not that that makes this quadratic and. The linear version is easy. Okay, so what happens in this model? Okay. So, uh, so the 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 Nash bargaining solution says, look, we're going to come to an agreement that's going to max, that's going to be efficient for the two of us, for, for me and, and the taxpayer. What does that mean? That means we're going to maximize our joint surplus, and then we have to share the surplus somehow. And you know. Different bargaining models get predictions for how we should share the surplus. The Nash bargaining model says, look, we're each going to get our outside option, and then we're going to get some, sh some fixed share of the surplus. OK? So what's, um, so the, the joint surplus from agreement is we add up the taxpayer's utility and the tax collector's utility. OK, we just add them up, right? And so I can, re I can rewrite terms, and I have this 1 minus r minus alpha minus beta 
times tau star minus tau. Tau star is the true tax liability, tau is the amount we report. We report. Okay? So what you can see is that as long as 1 minus r minus, tau, minus alpha minus beta is greater than 0, right, then we're, then we're going to want to under, we're going to want to uh, not report any taxes. We'll maximize, I mean, so you can't, you can't have negative taxes here, so we'll set tau equal to, to 0, right? And if this thing was less than 0, then we might as well t tell the truth and pay tau equals tau star, okay? So that, that tells us something interesting. That says, look, for some combinations of taxpayers and tax, taxpayers and, uh, and tax inspectors, they'd be in the collusive equilibrium if r is equal to 0. If like alpha plus beta is less than 1, they'll be in the collusive equilibrium if r is less than 0. But as I start to increase r, right, then some of them are going to be like, you know what, it's not worth it anymore. We're going we're gonna to switch from the collusive equilibrium to the non-collusive equilibrium and just pay taxes. And intuitively, what's going on here, what's going on is like I'm getting some utility losses from, 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 the, from, this, from, from this collusion thing. And the government is sort of sweetening the deal by throwing in this incentive. And it just, at some point, it gets to the case where the incentive plus the two utility losses is just makes the whole thing not worth it, the, the foregone incentive, right? So that says, look, so one thing that's going to happen in this model is I'm going to stop pay, some people will stop paying, stop, stop colluding and, uh, and pay more taxes, OK? But the other thing that will happen is that, so that's this, this case over here. The other thing that will happen, though, is that if I stay colluding, the amount of bribes I have to pay is going to go up. Why is that? So that's, that's, what, that's, you can see that in this expression here. That's just, so, so what, how do you solve this expression here? You basically solve for this by saying, what is the, um, what is, e, what is the bribe, right? The bribe is a way of transferring some share of the surplus from the tax payer to the tax inspector in this model, right? Because if we didn't have any payment, then the tax payer would get all the surplus. Okay, but they have to share the surplus, right? So they share the surplus by paying th through the bribe. And well, what happened? Well, remember that each person gets a share of their outside option. Um, uh, they get their outside option, sorry, plus a share of the surplus. So now the tax inspector's outside option has gone up. Because if they don't collude, the tax inspector is getting this incentive from the government. So now the taxpayer has to compensate the tax inspector for their foregone incentive plus share of the surplus. So that means that the amount they have to pay, the bribe, is going to be increasing in the incentive. And that, if you just, if you, the, the math gets a little ugly with the alphas and betas, but if you, if you just sort of uh, take the outside option and uh, a share gamma of the surplus, you get this expression here, which is increasing in R, the, the, the incentive. Okay, so that's kind of the, and you can sort of do a simple version of this, right? Like imagine it was, if there was no incentive, imagine there was no alpha, no beta. If it was a simple version, say, you know, if, if it was bargaining over a dollar, we split, the, we split the dollar and pay 50 cents. Now imagine like the tax inspector was getting, say, 30 cents, right? Uh, an incentive, a 30% incentive. The surplus is now 70 cents, right? Half the surplus is 35 cents. What's the bribe you have to pay? It's the 30 cents of foregone incentive plus the 35 cents of half the surplus. The bribe goes from 50 cents to 65 cents. Okay, and that's kind of the intuition. Is that, I'm going through this kind of fast, but is that clear? Yes? Okay, so what that suggests is that we, is that as we, I basically said that, uh, I said all this, right? So we have two different things going on. We have an equilibrium selection effect and an equilibrium bribe amount going up. And that suggests if we look in the data, we're going to want to look for both of those two different things. Okay, and that's what we do. So we chose property tax. So, so the first thing is sort of we get, we get tax revenue. That goes, this is actual tax revenue from administrative data. This is in logs. This goes up by about 9% uh, in the first year, 9.4% in the second year. So the government really is collecting more tax revenue. Okay. But to look for this kind of other thing going on, we, we did a, uh, we did a, uh, a survey. And we looked both at the general population and at the small subset of people whose actual official taxes, uh, tax liabilities change. This is called this reassess sample. And for the general population, they report in treatment areas a higher kind of going bribe rate. What does that mean? 
we asked a question like, what is the typical rate people in your area might have to pay to get your taxes adjusted? Okay, that was, that was you know, we didn't ask what you did, but I said, what's the going rate in your area? And that's going up by about a third, or by about 30%, roughly, in the treatment area as well as the control area. Okay? How often you pay people, people in your area tend to pay bribe payments also goes up. Um, we have a subjective free perception of corruption. That doesn't actually change, but both these things go up. We then also asked, um, how is this different for kind of this group that was actually you know, reassessed or like seeing their taxes change? So these people pay a lot more in tax, okay? So their taxes are going way up. And they don't report any th this increase in bribes. So this is like the reassessed people and the reassessed in the treatment areas is like almost like the opposite of this. So they're not actually seeing any changes in bribes, nor are they seeing any changes in bribe uh, frequencies. They're not actually seeing it go down on net, but they're not seeing these big increases. So that's consistent with the idea that sort of there's two different things going on, right? One group is seeing the high um, change in, in um, the high change in, uh, in, in bribes, and the other one is seeing like paying a lot more taxes. Okay, I think that's potentially consistent with the model. Um, uh, we also sort of look at whether they're being overtaxed, they're not, they're basically moving from being like undertaxed to being correctly taxed. So we can see that, that more of that in the paper. Um, you know, so what's the sort of point of going through this? This is one example, I think, of how we can think about the, so, so uh, you know, if you're moving to this question of tax administration, you know, as a solution to sort of some of the tax problems in these developing country contexts, then you have to think about the realities of how you do this. And this is one, some of the challenges you may actually face. And there's a lot more uh, stuff you could do in this area. I just wanted to sort of leave it, leave it at that. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and switch to the labor section if there's, unless there's any other questions. Okay. The, the, actually, the, let me just give you, the, the, let me just give you uh, one, one slide on this, which is um, the last topic I, that, that I just wanted to mention is this idea of informal taxation. So in the same way that um, there are ideas about like informal insurance or sort of other informal mechanisms sort of like supplementing kind of the, when the formal sort of systems break down, that people are sort of re, you know, insuring each other or doing other things, I think the same ideas actually also apply to taxation. And we have a paper that sort of discusses a few of these phenomenon and tries to think about how do we think about some of these, what, what, are, what is this phenomenon, how do we think about it as a tax perspective? And basically, there are a lot of cases where in local like village context, for example, there are these phenomena where basically people are kind of contributing to local public goods rather uh, for things that, like in the US, for example, we would do like through the tax system. So for example, you know, one of, you know, uh, I've been in these village, uh, village in Indonesia where it's like we need to pave a road. Like ha in Brookline, we need to pay a road, they like, set our taxes and they raise revenue from the taxes and they hire a tax, you know, a road paving company to pave the road. In an Indonesian village, what they might do is they might say, look, we need to pave the road. So we're all gonna get together and have a meeting and we're gonna kind of decide like, you know, how much we would like you to contribute to the road. And you know, what are, what are you all willing to contribute? And you know, Sal is willing to contribute, you know, two days of labor and you know, Aaron is willing to contribute like a gallon of, you know, a tank of asphalt and so on and so forth. And, you know, we'll get all these kind of voluntary contributions and use that together to build the road. At, the, at some level, these are like the same thing, right? We're both like collect, gathering a bunch of contributions from the population um, to fund some public good. But in one case, we're doing it through the tax system, which is, which is both formal and kind of has, has these very strong kind of formal punishments for refusal to comply. Or we could do it through this informal system. And so, uh, you know, in this paper, we sort of think about like, what is this informal system and what does it look like and how progressive is it and, you know, uh, and what's going on. And this is an area where I think, you know, we've done a little work through this paper. Um, uh, but I think that sort of understanding a little more of these voluntary systems of providing public goods is sort of an interesting area for, for future work and development, so I just wanted to sort of leave it out there uh, at that. Okay? So, you know, we have some stylized facts in this paper, which I'm not gonna go through now, but if you're interested, you could, you could look at that. Okay, other questions? Okay, sorry if I was a little bit rushing, but I wanted to sort of, to, to, to make sure we get onto sort of the, the labor topics. Okay. All right, switching gears. So the, 
The next set of things I wanted to talk about are labor markets and development. And this is actually another area where there's been a lot of, I think, a lot of movement in this literature. Even though the paper I assigned you to read is, is an older one, um, there's been a lot of movement in this literature over the past um, uh, five years or so. And so you'll see that even though we'll, the, some of the stuff I'm going to start with today is a bit older, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about over the in the next lecture or two is, is pretty, pretty recent. OK, so here's the. Um, overall plan, you know, so a, a theme that we're going to look at is how do we think about efficiency in labor markets and development contexts. I'm going to start with motivation from this idea of the, you know, quote, surplus labor hypothesis, which is a very old idea, and how do we think about that related to sort of the separation paper. I'm going to talk about labor supply. We're going to talk about the, the separation test as a test for sort of frictionless labor markets. Then next class, we're going to talk about um, nominal rigidities, behavioral issues, and other challenges in labor supply, um, and, uh, and some frictions in labor demand. And then I'm going to talk a bit about urban labor markets and how do we think about some of those issues as well. Okay? So that's kind of the overall plan. All right. So going even further back than the, the reading that I gave you guys for this, for this in some sense, the um, uh, you know, classic reading in, in uh, in development is this paper by Arthur Lewis from 1954. And Arthur Lewis basically um, argued that there was, quote, surplus labor, okay, in the countryside, in developing countries. And in particular, he said, you know, roughly speaking, about 25% of the labor has like zero marginal value. Okay, there's just like way more people than you know, we need, we need for the tasks that are needing to be done, and they're just kind of like, just really on the kind of the flat part of the, you know, production function, okay? And his claim, therefore, this is actually an important development claim, was he said, look, we can increase aggregate productivity if we could just move some of that surplus labor that's not doing anything useful from the countryside to the cities, right? We can do that, and he said, we can do it without even decreasing agricultural output. Okay, because they have zero marginal product, right? Okay. So that would mean that either the marginal product of labor is zero, um, because maybe because the agricultural production is Leontief. Like in general, right, we tend to think, we don't tend to draw production functions, you know, I mean, right? We tend to draw production functions as concave, right, not actually like flat, right? But, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe it's a, um, Maybe, it, maybe it's flat. Um, and, and, and why would it actually be flat? Because at some point, like, it ends up being that you just need more land, right? Like, so when I say, when I say it's the NTF, what do I mean? Like, at some point, at some, at some point, you run out, you know, there's only so much we can do with a given amount of land, right? No matter how intensively we farm it or weed it or whatever, like, at some point, you're sort of running out of, run, run, you're, 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 you run out of land, okay? Or, the other reason that, that this could be is that actually maybe labor supply is totally elastic at some reservation wage rate, and at some point, you know, maybe the mar maybe the marginal product is, is is still kind of like positive over here, but people just start stop working, right? Because you know, if people are being paid their marginal product, right? Then the then it, at some point, if there's some reservation wage rate, you know, if no one's going to work, you know, beyond, um, you know, say that you know the slope of this thing is equal to the, the marginal product is equal to the wage. Right. If at this point, if that wage, no one's going to work any below that wage, no one will work anymore. That's kind of how much labor we would get, and all the people kind of beyond that would just be not working. Okay. And so, the rationale here was that there was an important goal for development was to bring this surplus labor kind of into the into the cities. Um, this question of sort of like, should we have more people in the cities and less in the countryside is a, a broader, a very broad question in development. I'm not gonna talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that right now, but, but I'm gonna, we're gonna talk a lot more about that in 14772, where, we talk, where we're gonna talk about migration and sort of the structural transformation from kind of the, the countryside to kind of the, 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 and moving people from agriculture into the urban areas. Um, but I just wanted to say it's kind of, it is related to kind of this idea that sort of they're not, do, people are not doing very much, productive. Um, 
So in the spirit of some old papers, um, this is a paper, there, there was a paper by Schultz, 1964, which was one of the earliest natural experiment papers that I can find, um, which was about the surplus labor hypothesis. So Schultz studies the, studies the 1917-1918 flu, flu uh, pandemic, um, which uh, killed 6% of the population in, in India and reduced the workforce by about 8%. Okay, so um, you can imagine, you know, given that we were just going through, uh, you know, a disease that has like a one percent or two percent mortality rate, um, you can imagine what this must have been like. Um, so Schultz says, "Well, look, if there was really, if, if Lewis is right, and there's really twenty five percent surplus labor, then we shouldn't have any. Imp they should have no impact on agricultural output." Okay, so what do you think of this as a test, as an idea? Is this plausible, not plausible? Is this a good test, bad test? What do you think? Yeah, I'm in. Call it, call it uh, bias, but I kind of find it hard to believe a, like, pandemic can have no impact on capital markets. Oh, on capital markets? What do yeah. you mean? So the test here assumes that, okay, like, this is a change in labor, and like, if nothing else changes, this will be a test of that, like, whether the mar on, on the margin, um, the, whether labor is like, needed for these markets. But if they are getting their inputs from, like, say, from the, com from the countryside, from other, other places, chances are that this is, is an epidemic things were not going going from one place to the other very well, like as in the like, consumer supply crisis now. Uh, so there could still be a reduction in reduction in production, even though, even in the case. Yes, 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 absolutely, yes, yes, yes. So let me just also say that I have taught this paper many times, and this is the first time someone has brought up supply chain disruptions in my, in my, in this, but I think we've all had a lot of experience as to the many sort of like different channels that pandemics can screw up the economy. So, um, what's, sorry? I'm just still waiting for my PS5 that's still <laughs> But yes, 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 good point. Okay, what else? <laughs> that's a new one for this. I've taught this many times, never heard that. Okay, uh, what, what's another one? Yeah, Christine? Uh, the people that were killed by the pandemic are not necessarily equal to the ones that didn't die. So it could have been like people that were more weak or less productive physically were the ones that were killed. So I don't know, or the other way around. It's not necessarily random. Yeah, it's not necessarily random. Again, I, we're having so much better insight on how, like, <laughs> on understanding pandemics as an identification strategy. That's not, yes, exactly, right? It's not random. Yeah, totally right. And in particular, it would be bad if it was, um, he's actually gonna, gonna reject, gonna, gonna reject support th this. And so it, in the, if you I thought the pandemic was killing people who were more productive than average, that, right? Yeah. Other thoughts? What? You would assume, so, uh, I, I would have assumed ex ante to it for the people who died to go the other way. Like, it's the, uh, I mean, I would assume younger people would have a higher probability of survival. Chances are in a culture market where it's, it takes a lot of like manual labor to do, to do the tasks. I would assume people around like ages 20 would be more Fine. productive than ages with, or people. Yeah, so that would go, you, that would go, if that was true, that would go in, against the direction of finding an effect. What else? Maybe people that don't die but get sick have like lower marginal products after. Yeah, yeah. So maybe there's this additional thing beyond sort of the death of people who are like who are sick. Okay, any other? Okay, any other ones? Yeah, Hazel. There's also like a demand shock, right? Because people who are dead are no longer demanding. What's that? There's also a demand shock because the people who died no longer demand food. Yeah, there's also a demand shock. Right. Totally agree. Okay, so. That, and that would depend on whether or not you thought the, the products, whether there, was a, whether there was world trade or whatever. Although I guess it's sort of a global, probably, demand. This is a global pandemic, so maybe there's a global demand shock for food. So yeah, OK. So all right, so you may not love this. Um, and the other thing I would also, so I would also, um, the other thing I would also think about is the, the, the land reallocation process, what it may have been 
particularly, like, that's, that's the one I've always sort of most worried about, is it basically like, you know, if, if someone dot, like the we, land markets are not super efficient and sort of fast. And so if, if, I, if I own my farm and, and I'm a victim of the flu pandemic, then, then you know, it's not clear who's gonna take over my farm and that process of reallocating that land to more productive uses may take a while too. So that's all, all good reasons why this is not uh, the, the last word on this subject. What does he do? He looks at the, the output in the sort of the, the post year relative to the pre year, which had similar weather. And he looks at provinces that had greater influenza deaths had greater declines in output. That was, that's sort of his, his test. And uh, he looks at actually eight total acres sown. Actually, he doesn't have data on output. So they, are they sort of like plotting less, you know, doing less stuff? And um, here's his, he basically has the measure of deaths and uh, has prediction, predicted reduction in agricultural output and observed reduction in agricultural output. So he's running a regression of this against this uh, or against that. And um, uh, I actually had to run the regression on my computer and you basically get, an, with, with only 10 states, he gets an elasticity of output with respect to population of about 0 0.4. Okay, so he, he is actually finding a pretty substantial reduction in output uh, from, from, the, from the flu pandemic. Although as we've discussed, there are other reasons why this could be uh, an issue as well. Okay. Um, all right, that's all by way of background. Um, but I guess, you know, I, I do, I sort of want to mention this question of sort of our labor markets efficient and, you know, are people sort of operating kind of like where are people relative to the production function and are maybe they sort of way past kind of the point which they have low marginal products is an, is an, is an issue that people have been thinking about for a very long time. Okay. I think it's not, sometimes I feel like we only teach really modern papers and it's sometimes nice to think, realize people have been thinking about these issues for, for a while. Okay. So now onto this Benjamin paper, which you guys read for today. And some of you asked, why did I choose this particular paper to read? Uh, it was not, as you, as you picked up, it was not for, the, not for the empirics, but I think that the, and actually I'm gonna show you a more, mo like up until, although this, uh, I'm gonna show you a, a more modern paper look, that is a better empirical test, actually, of exactly these issues uh, in a sec, uh, but I don't want you to read two papers. Um, but what I like about this paper is I feel like it sort of really cleanly illustrates this idea of separation failures um, in sort of going through the, the various cases and the various models. So I wanna talk about that a little bit here. Um, and I think this idea of, uh, of separation between, like this, I, how, why is this kind of an important development model? I think that one thing that you see in a lot of developing contexts is you see a, a lot more self-employment. That basically, you know, uh, as we talked about actually in the, in the last lecture, the employee share is a lot lower, right, in a lot of developing country contexts. Context. So here, like in a developed country, in a developed country, most people are, not everyone, most people are employees, right? And whereas in developing contexts, I think most people are um, self-employed in some context, right? Or working in, the, working in their own, where production, and, and that means we want to think about sort of both for understanding their own household decision making, for understanding consumption decisions, but also for understanding production, right? If we have separation failures, then understanding what's going on on the household side is gonna be important for the productive side of the economy too. And that's gonna be really important in a developing country context if most of the people are kind of doing both. Whereas if we're, in, if we're sort of separated things out and we sort of are, you know, are in much larger context where people are sort of employees, that issue is kind of less relevant for, um, in a developed country context. So I sort of think of this as like one of these like important concepts that kind of comes up a lot because it describes kind of a lot of what people are doing in developing country contexts. Okay, so the question he's trying to answer at some level is how efficient are rural labor markets? And in partic particular, he has this test uh, of, uh, of the separation hypothesis. And broadly speaking, the way to think about the test of, the, of separation hypothesis is, is like, is my production decision and is my consumption decision, are those separate decisions or are they the conjoined decisions? Okay. And the, the basic theoretical idea is if I have fully functioning efficient markets, then households can freely buy or sell their labor at wage W. Okay. And therefore they're gonna make two separate choices. They're first gonna choose the labor input for their farms to maximize profits given the prevailing wage W. And then they're gonna separately choose the optimal labor leisure trade-off for the family given wage W. And with full ability to buy and sell, sell, sell W, there is no reason those decisions should be linked. 
Okay, so here's the key graph, right? So this is the key graph. This basically says, look, um, here's a production. This is the production. And by the way, like I found these graphs like a little confusing. Uh, I don't know if you, did you find them, were they clear or confusing? Metsanessa, okay, I'm gonna try to go, let me say I, I've taught them a couple, it took me a couple of times of teaching them before they became less confusing to me. So I'm gonna try, let me see if I can elucidate them. So what is going on? This is the production function, okay? So how do you choose how much labor to, 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 to use? We're gonna look for the tangency of, uh, you know, we're, you're gonna, you're gonna go to the point where the marginal product of labor is equal to the prevailing wage. Okay, so that's, this, that's given by this slope W, that's the prevailing wage. The amount of labor you're gonna want on your farm is given by the tangency of, the, of, the, of a line with slope W, the wage rate, to the production function of the farm. Okay, that's this. So that's, that's the labor used on the farm. And then how much labor am I gonna supply the household well, I'm gonna look for the, I'm gonna have some utility function, right? And I'm gonna uh, look, I'm gonna look for the tangency between my utility function and the wage rate, right? So I have some lab labor leisure trade-off. This is the utility function over here, right? Um, the, the, the bliss point uh, is over here, right? High consumption, low, low labor, that's the bliss point, right? So the utility function is facing kind of this way. Um, and I'm going to go to the point where it's sort of the tan where, where it's tangent to my to the wage rate, and that's going to decide how much labor I'm going to choose. Okay. So what you can see here is these are like set like <laughs> these are separate decisions, <laughs> right? This is like choosing. This is going to be driven. And you know, different pref people with different preferences. They'll move kind of their like labor leisure trade off some people really like leisure they're going to choose they're going to be over here some people really like labor they're going to like over here like some people are going to be over here whatever people will choose different amounts over here and then the farms you know different farms might have be steeper or flatter with different marginal products right you know di or di or different amounts of labor to sort of you know different marginal products for a given amount of labor and therefore different amounts of optimal labor and that's going to be a separate decision over here okay so the baseline model has two separate decisions so I'm trying to do a question. Okay. Yeah. This wages are exhaustion rate. Right? Yes. So this is not like I was just wondering why the the utility curve is not tangent to the production curve in the same intersection. Like Wait, what? Like I I I was wondering like Yeah, there's a market wage. Which is given part to us. Yeah. Yeah, so so exactly. So and I think the idea the way to think about it is like there's lots of different people with lots of different views around there, and some of them are down here and some of them are over here, or whatever, and there's some equilibrium in the labor market that's determining W. Okay, other questions? Does that labor, does labor demand not equal labor supply? I, I, I no, that was related to Vishan's question. No, it, it, for an individual household, it does not. In the market, sure. But this is an individual household decision. If households are identical, then it should. So, if households what, are identical, then it should. Yes, if households are all identical, then it should, yes. But if there's heterogeneity, then there's no reason it should in the, for any even, like some people, so that's what I was saying, some people really like consumption, some people really like leisure, the, you know, some people have big farms, some have small farms, you know, it's all gonna kinda, so for any, there's no reason those should be the same in, the, in any particular household. But the conceptual framework is like, I, so then the production is my own production, right? Yeah, this is my, this is like my farm. I can work in my farm and I can, Say if I have three hours, if I want to work three more hours, I can go work for three hours in a. Correct. That is the that is the model. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. So um. So now, what happens if there's rationing in the amount of off farm work work I can get? Okay, so suppose that, for example, like, so for example, suppose there was a minimum wage, right? So the minimum wage says the minimum wage says that basically people don't want to hire that much kind of like uh, labor above some wage, so so it's rationed. So now what's going to happen? Okay, or now what might happen? So at this high wage, right? Suppose it's rationed at H. 
So the farmer, what, what is the farmer going to do? They're going to first work at the outside high wage kind of as much as they can up to this cap H. That's why this graph for the farmer is like shifted to the left of the farm. Okay, they're going to work at H. And now after that, then they're going to say, well, I still, I'm not done consuming. Like, suppose they're not done consuming at H. They would like to work more hours than that. Then they're going to start working up their own farm. Okay? And how much are they going to do? Well, they're, now they're just going to look to the point where the tangency of their, they're going to, how much are they going to work on their own farm? They're going to work up to the point where their utility function is tangent to the production function from the, from the farm. Okay, because the more they work, as they work, you know, right over here, they're kind of earning a lot in some sense, right, because they're on the steep part. As they work, 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 they'll start earning less and less and less, and they'll work to the point where they're, where they're sort of uh, indifferent. Or, 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 sorry, where it's tangent. Okay? And the tangency here is going to be at a, um, you know, at this high, at, at this uh, uh, higher point here. And so, yeah, so, so th in this case, this is a case where um, they want more hours than they, than they, than they, than they can get. And, and what's critical here is that now the amount of work that's going to happen on the farm, like the amount of labor that's going to be employed on this farm with this production function over here, is going to be driven not by the market wage, but by sort of how much labor this particular household wants to supply. Yeah? If the, the slope at the utility production tendency was higher than the off-farm work, they wouldn't work off the farm at all. Is that right? I'm sorry. Say it again. Uh, if the, the slope of like that dotted line yeah. was steeper than the slope of the off-farm wage, then would they not work off the farm at all? If it was like down here? Yeah, that's going to be kind of the next case. If they wanted to work less than that, then um, they would they then we'd be in a separation case, right? What they would do is they would work. Um, and I think what would happen is on this farm, actually, what they would do is they would work say this amount down here, and then they'd hire some extra labor on the farm. So that we would be a separation case because they would be sort of choosing the um, the the amount of production on the farm would be driven by the market wage. So yeah, right. So it's only kind of an interesting case if the farm wants more labor, if, if they want to supply more labor than that. Okay. The next case is uh, kind of the opposite, which is to say, suppose there's some rationing on the amount of labor I can hire, okay, because the market wage is too low. Suppose the market wage doesn't go above, like it would clear at some higher level, but it's not kind of going above. And by the way, I'm going to talk in the next lecture, we're going to talk about some evidence that these market wages do or do not, like uh, looking at wages directly on do they or do they not kind of clear and adjust and why and whatever. So that's like another topic. But what would happen, what does this look like over here? So now it's kind of the opposite graph, right? So um, in this case, the farm, the farm would like to hire this amount of labor. Okay, at the market wage, but it can't get it. Okay, so so how much? So in that case, what's going to happen is it's going to get, um, it'll hire. It can only get sort of this much, this much L at the market wage. Right, and then after that, then the household will kind of fills in the, mar the, the the margin. And if the household is in this range over here, like if the household kind of wanted to work more, fine. But if the household is in this range over here, then again the total amount that's produced in the farm is driven by the household's utility function. The final, the final graph they have in the paper on this is um, imagine that sort of higher labor costs more than the farmer's return to off-farm employment. What's that? Imagine that basically it is cheaper for, like it's, more, it's kind of cheaper or more efficient for me to do the work than for me to hire the labor. So like you might think there's agency problems, right? Moral hazard, right? So I'm gonna work really hard on my own farm and kind of slack off and work on someone else's farm. So, in that case, um, 
if this is the market wage, the, the, the wage at sort of the, the market wage, if I want to supply less labor than the market wage, then fine, I can supply that and I can hire some extra at the market. That's separation. Um, if I want to supply, you know, tons at kind of the outside wage, I can supply over here. That's fine. But in this intermediate range, again, we'll get be driven by these tendencies. Okay, so, so what's the point of, of going through this? If we think that the market is fully, it, it's going back to this point. If the market is fully efficient, there should be no, re, no relationship between how much labor I want to supply and, the, um, and, and how much uh, labor is used on the farm. But with these different kinds of like, restrictions, if I can't hire enough la labor or I can't sell enough labor, I may end up either wanting to, I, I, you know, how much, it may be that how much labor I can provide on my own farm determines how much labor is available on the farm. Or conversely, um, it may be that how much um, labor I can just supply, I, I, how much work I can get just depends on how much work there is to do on my own farm. And in those cases, the labor supply decisions and the production decisions are interlinked. Okay, that's the basic idea. Is that clear? Okay. So then, the idea of the paper is to say, well, if that's true, then do household demographic characteristics, which should affect labor supply, right? Do those affect labor demand for the firm? Or for the farm, for the farm, in this case. Okay, so that's the so that's the idea. You say, look, we have sh shifters for household labor supply. If we're in the separation world, those should not affect labor demand on the farm, and if they do, then we're sort of rejecting separation. Is that clear? Okay. Um, you know, and I think this is a bit. Uh, it's kind of related to like a milder view of the surplus labor idea. Like if there are labor market frictions, you know, you may employ labor on the farm even if the marginal product is, is below the outside wage. But we'll, we'll talk about this uh, in a bit. Okay, so but the, then this becomes the empirical test. Um, so, um, so why might there be limits of separation? So here are a few, right? So. One could be minim literally minimum wages, right? Those are th that would that would create um, minimum wages. Say that the market wage is too high, right? And therefore, I may not be able. The farm may not be able to get as many workers as it would like at, the, at that wage. And the minimum wage could be a statutory minimum wage, or it could just be kind of a prevailing wage norm. And we'll talk about that uh, in some of the papers we'll look at next time. Uh, it could be imperfect labor markets, right? Or agency problems. Um, or sort of other market failures. Okay, so so there could be sort of things going on in the labor market, so this thing isn't totally clear. Okay. So, any questions on that basic theoretical setup? Yes. No. Clear. Okay. So as you guys noted, um, so what did you think of the empir empirics in this paper? There were various concerns about the empirics in this paper uh, that I read in your comments. I wanna, what do you think? Somebody. Yeah, I'm in. Wages can impact population density, is not it? What's that? Population density can impact wages, yes, but it can go the other way around. I think the using, using population density as an instrument for uh, labor supply. Like, I don't think exogenous assumption would be satisfied for an instrument. For using populate, yes. Right, so, and why? Um, so yeah, you, you are interested in the effect of, on labor supply on wages, right? Uh, Say places that have high wages can like attract people. Hopefully, it, it can increase population density. Um, did that call? Oh, I mean, I just don't see any any way how. 
Well, so okay, so because I'm also, so okay, right? So 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 as you saw, like one of the things he's doing is using population density as an instrument for wages, right? Because it is an instrument for labor supply, right? His idea is if there's more people around, that's going to like lead to lower lower uh, lower wages. So why is that not a good instrument for labor supply? Someone else? Like what, what what are the concerns there? Yeah. Um, population density can also impact labor demand. How? Uh, like accommodation or like maybe in cities like labor demand is higher, much of labor is higher. So, so one is if there's demand for non tradables, right? So, like if we have, you know, if labor supply, if pop in people where there are more people around, we need more haircuts, like so there, you know, it could affect through non tradables. Any other? I'll just give you another one, which is that. Um, so you know, it could, why why are all those people there? Like maybe there's something productive, like about the production side, which made, gave all those people there to begin with. So in particular, this this one takes place in this study takes place in Java in Indonesia, which has like a lot of volcanic soil, which is like super like productive, and that's kind of why all the people are there. I think is because like the soil is super productive, so it's not necessarily an excludable instrument. Um, so you know, just as you guys, I think you guys already saw this, but like I'm sure. So like you know. In fact, I'm sure you guys have already seen this, right? So, uh, I think this is from an earlier version of the class where we taught this earlier. But obviously, like you need you need the exclusion restriction. This is probably not gonna um, not gonna hold in this case. Okay. So another issue that comes up is this question of endogenous household size. So what's what's the issue? Wesley, who's gonna say something? Huh? If I want more labor, I'll have more kids. Yes. If I want more labor, I'll have so more kids. OK, so now I want to ask you guys a harder question. Is that a problem? And what I mean by is that a problem is, can that generate, suppose that was true. So let, let's, let's put us, so suppose we're under the null hypothesis, right, of delta equals 0. Can endogenous household size generate a false rejection of the null? Do you, do you see the question I'm asking? What do you think? Yeah, it's not. If it's endogenous exactly to the, the labor demand thing that you have on the left hand side, then you'll get the correlation. But in terms of like that's fine because like you're trying to see if there's a correlation anyway. Like, I don't know. Like, like this is only a test for correlation, right? Yeah. So, so in that sense, like, it doesn't matter whether you, whether which way. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, so this is the idea. So. So in in Wesley's story, I have more kids because I want more labor, in the household, but the only reason I do that is because of separation failure. Right. So if in fact, uh, the there was no separation failure, the delta was equal to zero, then I wouldn't be having more kids to sort of, to, 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 right? So I think, I, you know, I, I do think this is a bit of an issue, but I think it's worth thinking through, like, is this actually sort of a problem in there? Um, in there. You know, what I do think could be an issue is if we had admitted variables. Like, for example, if we had better land quality leading to more income, and like, you know, more income, like, leading to, you know, that kids are a normal good, um, then that could, right, that channel could, could could be a problem, um, but that's a more complicated story than I think the one you were thinking of, right? Because your story is only a problem under the if the null is false, but in fact, under the null it's not a problem. So I just think it's worth being a little more precise about sort of uh, the, the the concerns that we have sometimes. Um, does everyone understand this alternative story and why this, this this could generate a false rejection of the null? Yes. Okay. Um, what other, any other comments or thoughts from this paper from your, from your, what else do you guys think of this from reading it? Any other questions or thoughts? No? Okay. So, um, so as you guys, as many of you noted, um, 
the empirics of this paper are a little bit dated. And so one natural solution, uh, that, so Lefebvre and Thomas is kind of literally just updating this paper with better empirics, okay? And in particular, they have panel data. And so why is panel data gonna help? Yeah. So you're gonna have land fixed effects. Okay, so what's gonna be left? So, so what's, what, what else, so you're right. So now we're gonna have land fixed effects so we can control for all the sort of like heterogeneity of land quality and what's that's called, right? That's good, what else? Supposedly you can find good variation in late performance. Huh? You can find good, good variation. So what's the variation? So over time, if, even if a place has like huge, say, productive land. Maybe it's individuals, households. Verbs, huh? Uh, migration, we didn't have households. Someone else? So we'll, why, why would panel data help solve some of the problems from before? Okay, we're out of time. I will leave you to think, ponder this question. We'll come back to it at the beginning of the next class. So you can have a look at this paper and then um, I think whatever the next couple of starred papers on the syllabus are. We'll come back to this on, uh, on uh, actually, sorry, there's no class on Wednesday. Um, uh, and we're gonna come back to this so a week from today.